your copy of God's Word with me now, and uh, let's turn to the book of Job. And we want to look at two uh, distinct sections here and hopefully tie them together as uh, Job looks for hope of uh, enduring and surviving the suffering that he's going through. We want to look first at a uh, portion of Job chapter 14, uh, verses 7 through 15, and then we'll turn over to uh, chapter 19, verses 13 through 27. Beginning uh, with Job uh, 14 and verse 7. For there is hope for a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake, and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again, till the heavens are no more. He will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in shield, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait until my renewal should come. You would call, and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. Now we'll turn over to Job 19, verses 13 through the end of this chapter. He has put my brothers far from me, and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me, my close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they are engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that the last day he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say how we will pursue him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. May he write its eternal truths on each one of our hearts this morning. We uh, come to a section now in the book of Job where Job wrestles to, to some very high points, actually, in the midst of this unthinkable uh, suffering that he has gone through and is going through. If you recall... Uh, early on, Job, uh, a man of great wealth, a man of considerable influence and um, political esteem, I think you could say. He's known as uh, the greatest man of the East. Um, 
has everything taken from him. In no time at all, a matter of hours, uh, days uh, perhaps, uh, his ten children are killed, uh, his wealth is all taken from him immediately by uh, warring tribes that uh, band together and steal. And he is laid uh, waste, lying in the dust and the ruins of a great life that once was. His three friends then uh, come to uh, try and uh, encourage him, but they only uh, succeed in discouraging him further. Accusations are laid. plunges further into uh, darkness at the hands of his friends. But here in uh, chapter 14 and chapter 19, we're going to see that there are uh, three tools that are uh, at Job's disposal that Job takes up, uh, three things that he is uh, given uh, that each Christian, I believe, is also given. And uh, by God's blessing, uh, by uh, some uh, wherewithal, by uh, the sanctifying hopes to the sufferer. And we see that in Job. The three things are the power of God. Uh, the glory of God, and finally the resurrection. Uh, all three give us uh, great hope and uh, a pathway through uh, the darkness and the suffering that uh, inevitably comes into each of our lives. Uh, if we uh, look at chapter uh, 14 for just a moment, we see the power of God. Uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, in uh, verse 13 of chapter 14, Job 14, 13, Job says, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that is, the grave, the, the land of the dead. Oh, that you would hide me here, Job says, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and then do, in other words, summon me. And what Job has in mind here, what the context uh, gives us in this particular passage is, is kind of a courtroom scene. A summons is written out that you would appear at such and such a place at such and such a date and stand before the king or before the judge. This is what Job is asking for. He's crying out for now. And then when we go to uh, chapter 19, I think he's uh, pulling out here some of these things that he wants a hearing on. Uh, uh, all these things that have happened to him, that he lists, uh, the troubles in his marriage, uh, the ire and the condemnation that he now draws within uh, the public society where he's living, uh, children uh, mocking, uh, people whispering against him all these uh, falsehoods and wrongs. Job wants to be called into God's court so that if he has done something wrong, if he has sinned, he's saying, let's bring it out into the open. Let me be aware of it. Let me uh, pay for that sin, ultimately. Uh, but he, he needs to be clear. He wants God to declare him just, or at the very least, clear him of any wrongdoing. And what Job is uh, essentially doing here is admitting his uh, powerlessness here. 
He's acknowledging that his sin he cannot deal with in and of himself. He is powerless. God is all powerful. And Job needs a representative. He needs someone to stand before him during this trial. And this essentially is one of the key ways that we make it through suffering. And there's a, a valuable lesson for us to be learned here as the church that we don't need, we've, we've talked about this some already, oftentimes in the midst of suffering, the temptation for us who are not suffering is to show up, is to arrive as Job's friends do. And to give all the right answers. And they may be absolutely perfect answers. They may be the best theological answers that you could possibly muster up. But if you've ever been there before or on the receiving side of such counsel, you will remember, you will recall, you will see that this actually is not at all what the sufferer needs in their moment of deep pain. They don't need answers. They need your personal presence. They need friends that will come alongside, that will uh, defend them, that will speak simply, that will never cease to pray for them, and to be there for them, no matter what, and this is indeed what Job is looking for here, in this day of court, in his standing before God. One of my favorite scenes in all of Scripture, uh, has, and it's only recently that I've, I've really been reflecting on this, it, it comes in Acts chapter 6. Stephen is selected as one of the first deacons, and immediately uh, Stephen is wrongfully accused. Uh, he's dragged into court. He's summoned, if you will. And if you know the story, you know it doesn't go well for Stephen. He's accused of blasphemy by the religious leaders of the day. Um, and Stephen gives a masterful, a beautiful uh, uh, defense of uh, not even really himself, but of the gospel. He lays it out beautifully, and if you don't know the story as you're reading through it, you might think, well, he's going to get away. He's going to uh, be freed, and uh, maybe even those accusing him would be uh, convicted of sin and would... Uh, uh, fall down and confess Christ. That's not at all what happens. They seize him at the end of Acts chapter 7. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open." and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And what makes this passage really come alive is uh, the context around it. Stephen's in court. Stephen's on trial. And if you recall, if you've ever even seen uh, Law and Order, any of the Law and Orders that are out there, there's a thousand different varieties of this show now. Uh, you know in the order portion of it, usually the second 30 minutes, that in the courtroom, there are only a few people that are allowed to stand up in the courtroom, the chief of whom are the defense attorneys. And so why is Jesus Christ in Stephen's trial pictured and described as standing, it's because this is Stephen's advocate. This is Stephen's only defense, and it's the only one that he needs. 
that in Acts chapter 7, and yes, this is, this is nearing the end for Stephen, but it's okay. It's more than okay. Because he has Jesus on his side, defending him. This is what Job is looking for here in this. And this, for you, Christian, is the very best news that you can ever receive that your sins are accounted for, that you are defended by Jesus Christ. And how does he do it? He does it by placing his righteousness upon you. All his perfect keeping of the law, and he kept it perfectly during his life as a living, breathing human being. And so this is what is presented to not just the judge, but to any other human assailant, any other human accuser, that you are not guilty, not because of who you are or what you have or have not done, but only because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And, and do you see how that, that gives you what you need to, to, to take your next breath oftentimes in the midst of suffering, to relieve you of the guilt in this life so that you can, can again approach this tragedy, this, this setbacks, these uh, difficult times in life moment by moment more and more. It's the power of God functioning in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gets you more and more to where you need to be. The second thing that uh, Job experiences and uses to help him through the suffering is the glory of God. And we, we dig a little bit deeper here, but I think as we, we see it and as you start to see it, it becomes more and more obvious. And it's this truth that the suffering that comes in your life is what God often uses to make us more and more glorious. That is real. That is uh, well adjusted. That is those friends that do come, that do wait to talk, that do sit, that listen, that pray. You see that in verse uh, 7 of chapter 14, Job goes to the natural world and pulls an analogy from it. For there is hope for a tree, he says, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Uh, we have uh, mulberry trees behind our house. The birds love mulberries, and they will uh, oftentimes uh, sit on the fences around our houses and deposit the uh, mulberry seeds. <laughs> and uh, it's a difficult tree to to stop growing in your uh, fence rows. And what you have to do is that, that once you cut the mulberry tree down as low as you can to the ground, um, I was just looking this up this week, uh, apparently you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes to seal the stump with a this black type of tar uh, or else the uh, tree itself sends out a signal to the root system of the tree to start sending out, uh, I don't know what the official title is, we just call them suckers growing up, these little suckers that, that start popping up uh, eventually, and they then turn into other uh, trees if left uncut. Job is referring essentially to this, that, that right, uh, though its root grow old in the soil and its stump die in the soil, verse 9, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. We see in the natural realm the glory of God 
even in this. That it knows the tree is, is, is given such glory as, as this. Or if you uh, have trees yourself that are maybe a little bit um, nicer to look at than mulberry trees, you know that you have to prune them. And again, there's this uh, cutting that takes place. You have to actually physically maim the tree in order for the glory of it to eventually develop and to uh, grow strong. Job says, though, uh, he's questioning here, is this true for man? Verse 10, but a man dies and is laid low, man breathes his last, and where is he? Right? Job is questioning this. Don't forget, he is in the throes of it. He's in the middle of it right now. It's all very confusing to him, which is why we really need this directive. We need taught about the glory of God before the suffering comes. You know, I've, I've often alluded to this, but... Um, one of the things that, that greatly distresses me about the church today is that I think there's something of a parenting crisis that is going on in the church right now. It has to deal with our parenting styles, that we're not giving our children what they need to grow and to thrive in life in order for them to become glorious. I'll give you two examples here very quickly. Uh, first off, our uh, youngest child, um, uh, when he got uh, old enough to ride a bike, was, was not really getting it uh, all that well, and it seemed to be taking longer and longer. And uh, finally, one of the things I realized uh, was that he had become too dependent on the training wheels on his bike. And so in a, a moment of sort of enlightenment one night, I realized what I needed to do. And we took him to uh, our parents' house. I, there was a, a hill there I knew quite well. Um, uh, it, it was sort of a gradual hill, but it had some grass on it. And I got the... Uh, uh, the ratchet set up, took the training wheels off, uh, put this child on the bike, and gave him a push. <laughs> Away he went. Uh, I tried to keep up as, as long as I could, but eventually knew full well he was going to fall over uh, and bloody his knees, and indeed he did. I didn't apologize. <laughs> um, this realization uh, that Skin knees, uh, bloody knees, are exactly actually what children need sometimes in order to get it, in order to grow, in order to become glorious bike riders, if you will. You see my point that it's through the pain, oftentimes, that, that I had been trying to shelter my child from that was used to teach a valuable lesson. Let me, let me give you one other example. Uh, when my daughter was uh, very young, about three or four years of age, uh, we got her her first pet, Keely the Beta Fish. Uh, we were uh, on vacation one time and uh, came home to find uh, Keely doing the backstroke in her little jar or whatever it was, um, and so I did what I, I think any normal parent would do, probably I rushed out, found another red beta fish, uh, replaced Keely and all was well, and uh, I remember sharing this with our pastor at the time and him saying, uh, no, no, you know, that's what, that's what pets are for, that's what we mean, that's what pets are for. He said, pets are there in part uh, to, to teach us valuable lessons about life and death. 
And so I thought about it, and sure enough, went home and had to explain that uh, this is not Keeley, this is Keeley 2.0, uh, that Keeley 1.0 had uh, died over uh, the course of our vacation, and, and there were tears. There was heartache. But it helped pave the way several months later when uh, the second pet, uh, Blue the cat, uh, breathed his last right in front of him, uh, my daughter, and died. Which then paved the way for when Grandpa died. You see the point, and I'm not sure that, that I'm even making it all that well, but Suffering brings glory with it. It's not often the way we would like, certainly never when we want it to be. But this, in part, is how God works with us. Job is finding it out. You will find it out too. And so will your children. We have to find ways of uh, of being just and fair, but at the same time, not over-insulating, not over-protecting to where we're shielding them from the pain and the glory. One of my favorite authors, Marjorie Bianco Williams, uh, uh, I've uh, read a lot of uh, of her works. They're mostly children's stories, um, but also of her own life. Uh, she's been criticized, as you can imagine, by the press recently and in past days uh, because of a lot of the pain and adversity that she includes in her children's stories. She wrote in her defense once that Life is a process of constant change. There are departures for some and arrivals for others. And the process allows us to grow and persevere. In writing that, she was thinking uh, uh, in part about how her own father, who uh, by all accounts was a very devout, loving father, but died when she was only seven years old. The influence was very great, but ultimately one, I believe, that enabled her to teach and instruct, well, children from generation to generation on. Marjorie Williams, of course, the author of her best-known work is The Velveteen Rabbit. And if there's this, I think, rather glorious scene as the rabbit and the skin horse have this conversation, uh, what is real, asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room? Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and stick out, uh, and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with you, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be very carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand you get the point there, hopefully. That this process of life, and it is a process, it's a, a process of growing, of being sanctified by the grace of God, and one of those greatest sanctifying agents that God brings in our lives is suffering. 
But that rather than shy away or try and carefully keep ourselves and have the perfect little life that we imagined or that we see all the time on social media, the real is to suffer. And that in the midst of this suffering, God is. He's making you into the image that you were originally. Greater and greater you become, and better and better a friend you will be as you deal with the suffering that he brings into your life. And that's good news. You are not who you once were, that you are becoming something great. Job is hanging on to that. Job is realizing that. Job is putting that into practice more and more here. And as we're going to see, as he wrestles through the pain, the adversity, the setbacks, the suffering that he is going through, this is going to help bring him through it as it will yourselves. And so we come to this last and, and greatest tool that God gives us to make it, to navigate through the midst of suffering, and that is the resurrection. Now, it's an interesting question to ask about how does Job know about the resurrection, and I think we could spill much ink and many words on trying to figure this out. But ultimately, we don't know. Ultimately, we have to leave it to the fact that God revealed this to Job somehow, and be okay that we don't know exactly how Job got this doctrine of the resurrection, but he has it. And this is good news as well. That the resurrection from the dead, you'll notice it alluded to twice, which is why we've got both chapter 14 and chapter 19 before us. Right? In 14, verse 14, he says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I would wait till my renewal shall come. You would call and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands, right? You would call and I would answer. Job says that you would lay me in Sheol, or the grave, in verse 13, and then call me forth, right? I mean, that's the resurrection. And if there's any doubt that this is what Job is talking to, we simply have to go over to 1925, where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, that's the last day, the last judgment, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Again, the resurrection from the dead. The great hope of all Christians, all who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's three things, very quickly, that I think Job shows us about the resurrection. First of all, what it will be. You'll notice that the resurrection from the dead is a reversal of all the bad and evil and pain and suffering that we go through in this life. C.S. Lewis was on to something, I think, in, the, uh, in his book, The Great Divorce. There's a scene in there where... Um, father is explaining to his son about this. He says, son, you cannot in your present state understand eternity. That is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some tempor temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it, not knowing that heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. You see, what the resurrection of the dead shows us is that suffering in this life that you and I go through 
doesn't just go away once we get to heaven. It's not simply that our minds, our souls are sort of zapped and, and it's all forgotten. But rather, what the resurrection from the dead teaches us is that death and sin and the devil is defeated once and for all. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? You see that suffering actually enters into glory. And it makes the glory that we experience in the resurrection actually better for it having happened than it would if it had not. And you see that's absolute defeat. It doesn't get any more final than that. This is how complete, this is how absolute the power and the work of Christ is. The second thing that Job shows us is, first of all, what it will be. Secondly, how it will be. We go to chapter 19 again and, and see this here. Uh, oh, that my words were written down, verse 23, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. There's something absolutely magnificent and glorious about this. I think too often in the church and in our own lives, we think that those things that are spiritual, that are invisible now to us, will always be such, and that's not the case. That Jesus exists now, at God the Father's right hand, that that a right understanding of his ascension is that he remained in his physical resurrection body, right? It had physical dimensions to it. That it didn't just go poof once it hit the earth's atmosphere and disappeared from us, only to turn back into some spiritual stuff again. No, that Jesus is physically present. He's alive. And that this means that one day when he returns that we too will be physically present, alive in glorious new bodies that are physical bodies. So Job is saying here in verse 26, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job knows there's a change that's going to take place, that, that all sin will be done away with. It will be sealed up. It will be utterly defeated. And then what we will be left with is a physical resurrection from the dead that we will be able to one day see God face to face in a physical universe with physical dimensions and physical bodies. And if that doesn't get you excited, I, I don't know what, to be perfectly honest with you. But the final question, and this is why I, uh, in part I have included chapter 14 here. Um, I said the, the Acts 7, one of my favorite passages, Job 14 is, is, is probably even more favorite than that. And that's to, to try and sort of answer this question of how Job knew this was going on. We said in our introductory sermons on Job that um, uh, this is arguably the first uh, book of the canon of the scriptures. It, it very well into this patriarchal period around the time of uh, Abraham, even before uh, Moses, who we believe wrote the first five books of the Bible. Um, 
And, and so that adds somewhat to the mystery of how is it that Job knows all this stuff? Well, I don't know exactly how Job knows. We said that God revealed it to him, and that's the best and, and where we must leave it. But there are a few hints here. And so let me direct your attention uh, as we close this sermon to uh, Job 14, verses 14 and 15. Job says, If a man dies, shall he live again all the days of my hard service? Uh, that's the word for prison labor there. I would wait till my renewal should come. You would call, and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. Verse 15. That God would long for the creature that his hands have made. It's a glorious word. It's a beautiful word in Hebrew. It's kasaf. It literally means a, an overwhelming desire to long for, to be greedy for, on the verge of lusting after something. That this is the word that the author chooses to describe God's love for his creature. How does Job know that he will be raised from the dead one day? Job says here he knows that God longs for him. Remember back, some of you have been married a, a long time. Remember, though, when you were first dating your wife, your husband? And there's that moment, it seems, in, early on in the relationship where you sort of realize, oh, she wants to be with me, too. I've, I've longed for her to be with her for so long, but the feeling is, is mutual. This is something, somewhat, of what Job is describing here. But I think so often we think of our relationship with God as, oh, I want to be with God, I want to be with God. You see what verse 15 is saying here? It's not that you desire, you want to be with God, because sometimes I don't want to be with God. I'll be perfectly honest. But I'm mutable. I change in my desires. But here we see that Job understands that God longs to be with him. That God wants to be with you. And that that makes all the difference in this life. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, that, that Job gets this, but Job doesn't have the resources that you and I have to understand this as well as we do this side of the cross. And it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ that we can know this with absolute certainty. God longs to be with you. He desires to be with you because he did not stop his only son from dying a death that you deserved on the cross. That being with you, that being near to you was so essential, was so important to him that he sent his only son to die so that you might know with absolute certainty, this closeness that he has with you, so that you don't have to cry out as Job did for a trial, for an advocate, for a redeemer, because you can see in Jesus Christ, you know his name, that it's that true, it's that certain. It's that without fail that God has worked for you in your salvation. Isn't that one of the titles that he's given in Luke? Emmanuel, God with us. And so you see how the resurrection shows this to us. That even though it feels like your world is falling apart, and it may well be, that you cry out to God and all you seem to receive is silence from Him. There will be days 
like this most certainly, but that you never have to doubt that God is with you and he's for you even in the midst of this suffering, doing glorious things that you can barely imagine. Why? Because you know the certainty of what Jesus has done for you. And that, brothers and sisters, makes all the difference in the world. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice and thank you that you have done such great things for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that they would not just remain in our minds, but that uh, they would impact all areas of life, that we would go from here knowing with all certainty this great love that you have for us, this desire for us, and that you would continue to sanctify us, making us more and more glorious as you uh, are uh, resplendently glorious. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name.